uh, proponents of the Drug Pro uh, Policy Alliance to the repeal of, uh, to the reform of the Rockefeller drug laws. Uh, he is a uh, collaborator with the People's Institute in its work. And uh, we first met Gabriel in Seattle, right? You were living there many years ago. As a, you were even younger then. Uh, <laughs> But as someone who understood that, I won't go on, but he understood like few of us do that that, that you have to organize in an anti-racist way. You just can't know about quote, racism. You have to know what racism does structurally and find a way to organize uh, towards its undoing. And Gabe has done that within large institutional structures in such a way that uh, create, has created results. So, um, Marjorie, say a word about Gabriel. You have to call me with my mouth around a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> okay, well, uh, um, one of the reasons that I'm such a fan of Gabriel's is because about seven years ago, was it, Dave, in New Orleans? Yeah. The group of us who were white who felt that anti-racist organizing had to include white people, came together in New Orleans to talk about what that meant. And I don't know about the most of you, but I do know that out of my own experience, white progressives coming together to talk about race is often a cat fight. And it's very complicated because it often includes, I'm better than you, or I'm an individual, <laughs> I have succeeded, and you're not as good as. But that meeting, Gabriel's voice helped us to be a collective in a way that we need to be in order to do the work more effectively. So I just have, and I've been a, a camp follower ever since. And I want to switch places with you so you can have the audience around so that it can see you more easily. Yeah, I tried to get them to do that earlier. Well, do. I'm your elder. I need you to do that. <laughs> Well, Sandy to say a word, then Gabe and George. Yeah, um, that I just want to speak to his integrity. I want to speak to how, um, you know, in this work that we do, how it's easy to stop. And very often he's up against, you know, a, a lot of pressure from white institutional culture. And uh, I always respect and honor him. And he's another person that when you call him, he'll say yes. He always says yes and then finds a way to make it happen. So I just thank you, Gabriel, for all the work that you've done. And I said, for such a young man, if he did nothing else in his life but like lead, not lead the fight, but really picked up the fight around the Rockefeller drug laws and brought us to you know, a resolution, and now we continue. So Lord, if we did just, what, just that piece, that would have been enough. But I know that it's not enough, so we just continue on. Thank you, Gabriel, for who you are. Thank you. I'll follow that. <laughs> I might need a moment just to catch myself. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I work at the Drug Policy Alliance, which is a national uh, organization committed to ending the war on drugs. And we're a membership organization uh, with about um, 100,000 members that are nationwide, and we focus on policy advocacy and public education. Um, we're based here in New York City, but we also work in New Jersey, in New Mexico, uh, in California, in D.C., both congressionally but also as a city, um, and then a number of, of other places across the country. Uh, and our issues range from things focused on medical marijuana, like some of you may have heard that New Jersey just passed a medical marijuana law, and that was our office in New Mexico, or in New Jersey that worked on that, to sensing reform issues like the rocket and the changes here, um, to student drug um, education and drug testing, and, and a number of things. So there's a, we have a broad range in terms of our scope. Um, and given that the drug war has been a 40-year long set of policy um, debacles that stretch into a variety of institutions, there's no lack of things to do. And so we try to pick up and work on some of those issues. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, racial and ethnic impact statements as a policy-making tool um, that can be employed in an anti-racist context as part of an agenda to put um, race and racism in particular on the table in policy-making, um, and also as a, as a means by which to address uh, 
the institutional disparities and inequities that exist across a range of systems. My context or what I, where I work in is in within criminal justice and drug policy, so most of my um, anecdotes and focus areas are going to be in those institutions, but, um, but a lot of the, the tools and the concepts are applicable whether you're looking at child welfare issues or mental health issues or, or any, almost any institution. Um, there's some basic um, similarities that we'll be able to draw here. Um, I brought materials that I realize now that I did not bring enough. And so I'm going to pass some things out, but for those who don't get them, I, just give me your cards and I'll email you everything that I've got here today. Um, but the, I want to, the course of the afternoon, because I think this goes until 2 p.m., is that right? Yeah. So I'm going to take about maybe a, a little, maybe 45 minutes for the presentation and then open it up, and I'm less than 45 minutes for that, and then so we can take the bulk of the time to do Q&A. Um, does that sound okay? Um, okay. So, racial and ethnic impact statements. Um, has anybody here heard of these before? Before the, has anyone here ever heard of this before? David has, so not many people have. So how many people in the room have heard of an environmental impact statement, right? Okay, a lot of people have, or an economic impact statement. So within uh, policy making, one of the things that happens over the course of a, um, um, a uh, legislative campaign, creating a bill, you know, you have a legislation, is that usually legislation, if it's going to cost anything, has attached to it an economic impact statement or a fiscal impact statement. Because in our system of government, you want to know how much the thing is going to cost. And so there's always an attachment associated with that, right? Similarly with environmental impact statements, I live in Brooklyn and right now there's a huge fight underway about the development of the Atlantic Yards. For those of you who are in Brooklyn, you know what I'm talking about. And a lot of the, of the effort to slow that project down, it's a major development <coughs> project that um, is quite controversial. Uh, a lot of the efforts to slow that down have revolved around ec um, environmental impact statements. So. You're going to build something, you got to tell us what it's going to do to the land here and to the environment and to the community and so forth. The environmental movement has used economic or environmental impact statements for the last 25, 30 years to really transform um, not only their movement and, and efforts, but development in general around the country. And whether we're talking about New York or other areas, environmental impact statements have become a really important tool in the toolbox that environmental justice activists <coughs> use. Racial impact statements are very similar. Essentially, it's asking the question that anybody who has been through an Undoing Racism workshop asks just by virtue of whenever a discussion comes up about any proposal or any sort of outcome or any issue, which is, well, this is what your proposal is, but what's, what does this look like based on you know, outcomes if we view this through race and ethnicity? What are the outcomes going to be? And it really is as simple as that. Right? There's not, it's not much more complicated. How one devises the impact statement, who's responsible for doing that, <coughs> what are the jurisdictions that should be involved, what are the questions and assumptions that should be employed in its, in its creation, those are all things that are the, the details, and that's, of course, where the devil is. But the concept itself is actually quite simple and accessible. Um, now, coming out of a criminal justice context, the... Um, there's few institutions um, that have seen the level and over a period of time of racial disparities as has the criminal justice system, which is not to say that any other system is doing much better. But with the Rockefeller drug laws as a primary <coughs> example, 90% of the people that were incarcerated under these laws uh, right now are black and Latino in the state of New York. Now that has absolutely nothing to do with who it is that's... Um, using, that has nothing to do with who's using illicit substances or who's selling them predominantly, or crime, actually. It has everything to do with the way that the system is focused, who it's focused on, and how people who are caught up in various systems are treated once they come into contact with them. Um, there is no comparison that we have around the world uh, within a criminal justice context for the incarceration rates that, have that are being experienced now in the United States. Um, and it's certainly that we're going on here under the Rockefeller drug laws. Um, and just not to, it's lunchtime and I don't want to make people's eyes glaze over, but with, just to put some context on this with respect to numbers. Um, 
right now, there around the world, there's about 8.5 million people in prisons and jails uh, who are incarcerated, and these are statistics that are studied quite closely by a number of institutions. Um, in the U.S., which is 5% of the world's population, we have 2.3 million people incarcerated today. Now, that's just in prisons and jails. If you add in people that are under the supervision of the criminal <coughs> justice system, either through probation or parole, or other mechanisms that might be applied, you're looking at nearly 8 million people. Now, no country in the history of the modern world has ever incarcerated people this way before. For 5% of the world's population, we incarcerate 25% of the world's prisoners. It's, um, in my personal opinion, as a person who works in this field and works on these issues and thinks about and runs through these numbers pretty regularly, um, I, it's my opinion that I don't think that any of us, myself included, can actually comprehend what these numbers mean. I think that there's a certain point at which they just become another statistic that sounds actually pretty horrific, and certainly is, but the level of uh, what that means uh, or the, the depth of its um, impact on individuals, families, communities, psyches, um, systems is so profound that I, I'm, I dare say that I don't, I don't think that there, almost anybody can actually comprehend the scope of what it is that we're actually dealing with. And certainly there's no historical context for it. Not even in South Africa uh, during apartheid was their incarceration rate, particularly of black people during that time, does it match the way the United States is incarcerating black men mm -hmm. today? Um, and that's not hyperbole. That's just, those are about incarceration rates in practice. And so when we start talking about these issues, sometimes the, the statistics and the comparisons can sound startling and jarring in some ways. And it's because there are. There just simply isn't anything that we have to compare this with. And there's not much of a context, therefore, for us to reference and understand what any of that actually means. Um, when the United States to put some historical context into this, um, and, then, and then we'll get into, what I'm gonna do at the time is I'm gonna provide just a bit of a historical context. I'm gonna use the Rockefeller laws as a primary example of policy making in that, and that is very clearly about race, but does not have any tool employed in it to devise the outcomes in a way that, are, uh, that might help advocates. Um, so we'll talk about that. And then I'm gonna talk about three different examples that have been deployed um, with respect to these statements, they could be applied whether we're in whatever system, healthcare or a number of systems. When, when there was, um, when the Rockefeller drug laws were being debated in 1973, um, so the, the, that's quite all right. Um, we're in a really interesting context here. We're at the end of the 60s rights, civil rights era, at the end of that 20 year revolutionary period. Um, there's a, a major social shift that's beginning in the, in the um, follow-up to that period. And there had been, and before Nelson Rockefeller presents his drug laws, um, some years prior, there had been a declaration, an ideological declaration, made by Richard Nixon calling for a drug war. Uh, when Nixon declares the drug war in 1969, there's no, absolutely no scientific evidence that suggests that drugs are actually even a problem. And certainly in polling, drugs are not identified by the American public as being something that's a major issue per se. There's a lot more drug use going on, certainly it is the 60s. But in terms of a public safety problem and things, and absolutely with respect to um, the actual health of people and communities, drugs were not necessarily public enemy number one, but Richard Nixon elevated them to public enemy number one for a very particular and specific reason. Um, which is well documented in the, uh, in the history. Uh, they needed a way to target and talk about black communities without actually saying that they were talking about black communities. Um, now this is all in the historical record and it's quite easy to find. You can probably get it on Wikipedia, but if you dig a little deeper into historical records, including uh, the members of his staff, you'll find many of these quotes. What they had was an ideological declaration of the war on drugs. What they did not have was a real set of policy formations that was going to apply that in any real consistent, thorough way across the federal government. Um, it was Nelson Rockefeller in 1973 that introduced the, the Rockefeller drug laws as the, the first such um, set of their laws in the country. There's a couple of reasons why almost anywhere you go across the country and talk to maybe not the, you know, um, 
average Joe on the street, but if you talk to people that pay even a nominal bit of attention to criminal justice and drug policy issues, almost anywhere in the country, they will have heard of the Rockefeller drug laws, and there's a few particular reasons for that. The first of which was Nelson Rockefeller had presidential ambitions, and his laws were really the harshest things that had ever been proposed along these lines before. It was a system of mandatory incarceration um, for low-level and high-level drug offenses. And it was a calculated shift to essentially say treatment and social service programmings simply do not work with respect to drugs. The only thing we can do is get tough. And here's my proposal to do so. Now that resonated nationally just because nobody had ever seen anything like this before. But the second reason it resonated is the purpose to which <coughs> Nelson Rockefeller made these um, proposals in the first place, which is presidential ambitions. He was looking to be president. He needed to burnish his credentials as a tough on crime Republican. He was a, when they had them, he was a liberal Republican. There are not much of those left anymore. Um, he was from a liberal state, New York, and he needed to be able to show that he was tough enough to lead the country as president. His presidential platform then is where the Rockefeller drug laws were quite often discussed. And in the years preceding or after following that, many other states that wanted to be tough on crime and tough on drugs proposed laws, that, and they called them Ohio in 1977. This is our version of the Rockefeller drug laws. It's one, it's one of the reasons why so many people know Rockefeller is because it was essentially the policy model for that ideological declaration that, uh, that Richard Nixon made in 1969 that was absolutely and very clearly about social control of black communities. That's, the, that's where this stuff came from. Now, it was Ronald Reagan that took that ideological declaration of Richard Nixon and the policy framework provided by Nelson Rockefeller and provided that policy framework across the federal government when he relaunches the war on drugs in 1982. And you see a spike, an extraordinary, unprecedented spike in our, in our incarceration rates and in the funding provided to police agencies and to prisons going from that point forward. Um, just about 200,000, 250,000 people in prisons and jails in you know, the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. When Clinton leaves office, there's over 2 million quadrupled over that period. If you just look at what happened in New York, it's actually very striking. Um, New York had 32 prisons that it built from 17, uh, I think, it's the late 1700s, and I think it's the 1780s, when the first prison was built in New York. Until 1981, it had um, 32 prisons. From 1982 to 2000, it built 38 more. So, and that was all done uh, in part for, um, not to get off track here, um, but remember in that period in the 70s and 80s is the deindustrialization of the United States, what we call now globalization. Corporations that were in upstate New York that had provided steady middle class incomes for upstate communities, many of them anyways, were pulling up the tent and you know, going across seas to make more money. The upstate economy now, we all understand, and it's, it's reported on fairly regularly, the decimation of the upstate economy in New York and just how destitute much of New York is. Uh, it was rural white communities that were told in the 80s by the Cuomo administration and followed up with Pataki afterwards that these prisons will provide jobs to you. So there's a very direct link, which is why you see today, in any debate around the shrinkage of the prison population, the very open... And that's just the fire department is running a test on our follow-up. This happens at our office all the time. Please disregard uh, all follow-ups you may hear until further notice. <laughs> Attention, the fire department is running a test on our follow-up system. Please disregard all follow-ups you may hear until further notice. Thank you. Um, they, there was a period there in our office where they were doing that every day for weeks, trying to fix our system. It was real. Um, anyways, the Newburgh, New York, wants to host the trial of the terrorists. Undoubtedly. That yesterday? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 So they made a formal proposal. They would like to host the trials. The prisons are, are, are what the thinking is, although it's proven to be actually quite inaccurate, is that prisons are money for the communities in which they're located, which is why today almost any proposal you see for the shrinkage of prisons, if you read the upstate press, um, and even sometimes the downstate press, what you'll find is it very inter it's actually really worth checking it out because when people will say, um, we have to keep these prisons open and filled in order for us to have jobs. 
Now, in and of itself, that might be a, like something that just got ignored. But if you consider who it is that's in those prisons and who goes to them, who essentially they're designed for at this point, and it's not an overstatement to say that that, uh, that who it is they're designed for, because that's who's there, certainly with respect to Rockefeller. Essentially what they're saying is we need to continue to fill these prisons for, with black bodies so that us as rural white people, which is where I come from, a rural white community in California, can continue to have jobs. The economic um, motivations here are absolutely clear. They're not secret. It's not a conspiracy. That's one of the things that makes it all so compelling in some ways because it's all actually right up on the table. With that being said, you can see from the passage of these laws and the implementation of the drug war in the early 70s and New York's version of it, the Rockefeller laws, an explosion happens with our incarceration rates. We actually top out in New York after having 14,000 people in 1970. We top out in the year 2000, 1999 actually, with about 72,000 people, a quarter of which are there on drug charges. 94% of which at its highest rate, 95 actually, are black and Latino. Now that all happens, keep in mind, the crack scare in the 80s, some people call it epidemic, certainly for some communities it was, happened when we had the toughest laws in the country. So it's important to keep that in mind. In any discussion around criminal justice policy, and particularly with respect to drugs, because there's this, for 40 years we've had this knee-jerk, almost unthinking reaction, because it's assumed to be true, as true as the air it is that we're breathing now, that the appropriate response to anything that comes up with methamphetamine or heroin or kids and drugs and overdoses and all these sorts of things is to get tougher but probably the single biggest and most well understood epidemic in this country in the last 40 years with respect to drug use, now that's not in terms of actual usage but in perception, the crack scare of the 80s happened in a moment when we had the harshest laws on the books ever. That happened under the watch of the Rockefeller drug laws, right? So when the prosecutors are out there saying we need to not roll them back because we'll go back to the battle of the crack days of the 80s, you know, the, part of the reason the that gets pleased is because of the historical amnesia. And some of it is, in my opinion, is very much as a result of where race comes into play in these discussions, and particularly racism. So all of us in the room presumably understand the Rockefeller drug laws were rolled back last year. We may not understand the details of what that meant, and I can pass information out to you that will explain that. Please respond to all laws as you normally would at this point. Fire law test is over. Please respond to all fire laws as you normally would at this point. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things that when the campaign um, after years of, of efforts to try to roll back those laws. Um, and just as a summary, so we're, all in the, we're at least working with the same language, which included mandatory prison terms, some of which were life for even first time offenses, even if they were nonviolent. Um, the, court, the judges essentially had no discretion in the process. It cost New York half a billion dollars a year, that's a B, um, to run that whole program. Meanwhile, treatment programs, and mental health and housing and other things are all being cut steadily over the same period of time. We know uh, they didn't, they can feign that they didn't know it in 1973 when the laws were passed. 30 years, science has come, 40 years, the science has come along pretty significantly, as has the practice. We know actually now, well, some of the things that work with respect to um, addiction treatment, we know a lot more about uh, some of the motivating factors that involve people with, with drugs, whether they're using it recreationally or they have an actual problem with it. There's just a lot more that we know now that could shape and inform policy making. Um, and even when we knew that, uh, th those things were not necessarily enough to get the laws changed. Even when we were able to point to the extraordinary racial disparities that were associated with the laws, um, those things were not enough actually to get the laws changed. It took a kind of alignment of years of a campaign work and a particular political situation in Albany and a campaign that had spent a lot more time losing which is what we tend to do in campaigns. That's just the truth. We lose a lot more than we win. Um, but all of those losses can sometimes, we don't like to talk about them all the time, but I can tell you as a person who was involved in that campaign a long time, we lost a lot more than we ever won. Um, but the losses became real opportunities for us to evaluate and test things out and figure out what worked. And when understood in that light is how we were able to shift the campaign significantly in the, in the final years and get us, we finally were able to get over the... the um, um, the goal line in 2009. Um, there's no more, um, I'm sorry, the mandatory prison terms that existed on the books 
the vast majority of them no longer exist. There's no longer a requirement that people, when charged with a felony drug conviction in the state of New York, go to prison. Um, there is still for a certain range of felonies, so it catches about 10% of all people that go to prison on drug charges. But 90% of the people that are there are serving uh, prison terms for which there's no longer a mandatory uh, imprisonment for that term. Um, we've expanded drug treatment and other social services pretty considerably, although certainly not as much as we needed to. We restricted the right of the, uh, or the role, I should say, of the district attorney, um, who is a partisan player in every case, just as the defense is. The judge is supposed to be the nonpartisan um, official. We restricted the role of the district attorney and restored it to what it traditionally should have been under our system of courts, um, which is to bring a charge and then prove your case. Um, 1,200 people that are currently incarcerated under the laws um, are going to be able to apply for resentencing, and we're working on, and I've actually worked with somebody in the room on this, to ensure that they have access to the services and legal defenders that they need to get out. Um, and thousands more, if implemented appropriately, will never see a prison cell. Um, out of the 6,000 people that go to prison a year on average at this point on drug charges in the state of New York, uh, between three and 4,000 of them, we believe we can actually divert out of prisons and into social programs, treatment if they need it, and a lot of people don't. Um, there's a lot of other stuff I could sh share with you about the laws, but um, what if in the debate around Rockefeller in 1973, there was an instrument that we could use to show, not just with a report that we had produced by a prestigious research institution or a you know, a, a series of interviews that have been collected or a historical analysis that we have, but an actual legislative document that's in the record. What if we were able to show that the passage of these laws was going to lead to the mass incarceration of communities of color and actually probably no benefit for white communities, even the ones that are being told they're going to benefit by getting a prison in their district? Because that ended up not being much of a benefit for them. Um, I don't know if it would have been different, but at least we would have had something on the record. A lot of what happens in policymaking, in my experience, within criminal justice realm, and I can't speak to other issue areas, but I presume it's similar, is that those of us who understand the history that we, te that we learn um, in the Undoing Racism workshop and the trajectory of um, those histories and the power of institutionalization of racism to affect a broad range, almost every aspect of our lives, oftentimes in ways that we're, we never talk about it or even think about it, even in private, unless we're consciously attempting to do so. Um, we oftentimes find ourselves in situations where we're trying to explain all of that to a policymaker who may care about it quite deeply, but is working themselves within a system that has helped create that very circumstance. And indeed, individual policymakers are oftentimes, even when they are deeply passionate and committed um, organizers, even if they carried um, an undoing racism analysis with them, um, the likelihood of that individual policymaker to be able to navigate those institutions and uh, ensure that policies that pass through either their committee or things that they proposed or things that were debated on the floor um, accounted for those histories is nearly impossible. It's an unreasonable expectation on our part. Um, that being said, what if we created a, a legislative tool, an instrument, that forced the conversation about race and ethnicity and its impacts as part of the discussion around the implementation of any piece of legislation while we're talking about it in the beginning. Now where we've been for years, with Rockefeller as a prime example, I can't tell you the number of, of elected officials and their staff who I've spoken with over the last um, six years on this, working on this issue, um, to explain to them and given them reports done by their own legislative offices that say the outcome of this legislation is severe and here it is. There it is, there's all the data. It's not even from us, it's from people you trust actually. It's the Legislative Review Office or the Sentencing Commission or whatever it is. And they say and they nod and they're like, yeah, I know, but the thing is it, it, the law has already been passed. If we were able to take with some of the proposals that are coming out now, and um, part of the reason for focusing on Rockefeller is because if you, the policy um, debates that are going to take place over the course of the next year, Rockefeller is going to be a, a principal part of them as they try to roll some of those policies back. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But there's going to be, there's already proposals out to enhance penalties for drug dealers, enhance penalties for um, those people is the term that's used, and, we, and they're euphemisms, essentially. Um, 
those sets of policy proposals that have still a potent um, ability to empower uh, an official because uh, the tough on crime, war on crime, remember we still, despite the rollbacks of Rockefeller, we're still the country that has 2.3 million people in prisons and, and, and uh, jails in this country. Uh, tough on crime works politically for a lot of people and it has for a long time. There's a reason why it's employed the way that it is. So you say, well, all right, what, you got your proposal. What if we could say your proposal have a legislative produced document that said, great, you want to be tough on crime, like your proposal is actually just locking up black people, which is what I'm really hoping we get to with the passage of these statements at some point. But um, racial and ethnic impact statements, to summarize, is a tool to be able to do that. And to whether you're talking about the criminal justice system or mental health systems or child welfare systems or whatever, they're a tool that's being increasingly developed to require the legislature in the same way that it would account for the fiscal impact of a bill. And the fiscal impact is what legislators use. They say that, here, on your proposal to create this new widget it came with a price tag of $2 million. And that's all of a sudden the quote, right? It's right here. Here's the fiscal impact statement. It's $2 million for your widget. That's why we can't do it. Imagine what happens if they say, we're going to pass these new crimes to be tough on this, or we're going to do this new, we're going to shrink this, this um, our proposal is to shrink access to mental health facilities across the state. But it's going to be great. And there's a fiscal impact, or a racial impact statement that attached to it that says, if you do this, the communities that are actually going to suffer most, according to the legislative review, are black and Latino communities in bed -Stuy or wherever. Racial and ethnic impact statements are a tool to make that conversation happen at the front end, number one, so that it's out and clear and in the historical record and the legislative record, as opposed to just being something that's talked about in a testimony. But the legislators themselves and their staff and the whole nine have to produce this. That's number one. But the second thing is for organizers to create a tool for us to be able to bring race into the conversation and racism into the conversation in any policy proposal. And, and not do that at the end, after the thing has gone through, and the impacts that we could likely anticipate, even on the back end of a napkin, if we thought about it for a minute. But instead of, of anticipating that and then having to wait for the data to roll, to roll in to show us that we were right, that actually this act is just impacting predominantly low-income black and Latino people in the city of New York. We have a document that's produced by the legislature that says this is what's going to happen if this bill passes. Now, when I say that it's a tool for organizers, what I mean by that specifically is a racial and ethnic impact statement is not enough to stop the passage of anything just as an environmental impact statement or a fiscal impact statement is not. There's simply devices that can be um, utilized by organizers and advocates. So. Racial impact statements can be applied to almost any proposal. Um, I'm going to pass out a document to you today that, that gives you a sort of a background on how it can be done in different jurisdictions and what different organizations out there focus in those areas, so environmentalism and health issues and education and so forth. And so you have a resource document when you walk out of here that if you wanted to learn more about it, you can read this resource document and find out with these organizations how it could be applied there. Um, but the situation that we're in now with, with the Rockefeller laws and its, and its sort of extraordinary impact and the unprecedented um, um, levels of incarceration and racial disparities that we found in these laws, I, I'm not suggesting at all um, that, that we would not have had a Rockefeller drug laws and, and uh, had we had a racial ethnic impact statement in 1973. What I am saying, though, is that now as we're working to try to pass a racial ethnic impact statement law in the state of New York, we're doing so very much tied into the reform of those laws and saying, now that the laws are reformed, implementation is going to be essential. But as we proceed, we need to try to make sure that we never again end up in a scenario where 90% of the, the people that are locked up for anything are predominantly people of color, even when we have all the data that says to us that um, there's simply no reason for this in terms of what we know about the issue. Um, I've got with me a uh, uh, paper that I'll pass around to all of you that is about uh, racial impact statements. And again, I'm sorry, I don't have enough, but at the end, if you give me your card, for those of you that don't get one of these, um, I'll make sure that you get all this. Uh, this is a, an article that's written by 
a uh, man by the name of Mark Maurer, who's at the Sentencing Project, who's been doing a lot of the theoretical work and legal work um, for thinking about racial impact statements as it applies to the criminal justice system. And so it's a, it's a, this is a helpful document. I'll provide you some of the background and context for it. Um, I've got some other stuff here that I'll pass out to you in a moment um, that deals with legislation and, and examples. But before I do this, maybe we can pause here and open up if people have questions um, they can ask. But I think some of the stuff I brought will hopefully be useful as examples of how this is being um, utilized in other areas. You said that there's legislation being considered now to pass this in the United States? Right now, we're working in New York on, um, there's not a bill yet, there's not a, an actual piece of legislation yet, we're working on developing one, and we hope to have that bill um, introduced by the end of February or beginning of March that would require the state of New York, I mean, what this bill says um, is that, what it will say, it's, it's being, it's, we're still drafting it, what it will say is that any legislation that would have an impact on, um, uh, that would change the penalties, um, that, so it would have an impact on people that are incarcerated or under the supervision of probation or parole, or um, uh, being incarcerated in a prison or jail, would have to have, before it went to committee for debate, a racial and ethnic impact statement attached to it. And so um, the purpose of this is yeah, very much part of our, our, of our campaign around Rockefeller drug law reform implementation um, to use the momentum that we had through that campaign of trying to win the reforms um, to account for some of the pieces we know we need to account for with respect to implementation. Um, so that's what this is going to do. So it's, very, it's narrowly construed around the criminal justice system. There's no reason why similar pieces of legislation or more sort of global pieces of legislation couldn't be introduced um, that dealt with the a broader range of institutions. Yeah. You might address this later, but how did you do it? You had been, had been groups uh, storming Albany around repeal or reform for years. What happened came to bear in 2009? What was the organizing process that eventually, uh, what I characterize as a victory, I'm not sure you do, but the uh, that which happened. Yeah. No, I, I very much characterize as what happened as a victory. And I, in my, my personal opinion, and it's biased because I worked on it, is that this is, this is arguably the single biggest criminal justice um, and one of the largest civil and human rights victories that we've had in the last 35 years. Um, because, but it, because it's systemic in nature, it's really difficult sometimes to to grasp onto because it's more ethereal. But the way that, um, the, there, I think there's, there's three things that happened that, um, that we did that I think were probably the principal um, alterations that we made in the campaign that led to the reforms. Um, or three things that, some of them were things we did, some of them were just things that existed. One was um, we spent a lot of time thinking about why we kept losing which I hate losing, and as anybody does, I really dislike it. And I especially hate losing on issues like this, and I especially hate losing when our opponents are actually not as well organized as we are, or can be, but they're just, they get to draw on a lot more of a power base. Um, well, what we realized in New York was that New York's drug policies were really, we, the losing forced us to make an assessment, and in the assessment, what we discovered, we sort of looked at everything around drug policy. And what we discovered in New York was, as bad as the Rockefeller drug laws were, New York had actually developed these other really interesting policies pertaining to drugs and drug use. Syringe exchange programs is a primary example. Mm -hmm. It's arguably the most successful public health intervention, that, or one of them that's ever been done, and that's what the public health department of the state will say. 72% of the people that had HIV and AIDS in um, the early 90s were injection, could be related back to injection drug use. 7% could be, the, is the number that you can relate it back to, to today, of people who have HIV and AIDS related back to injection drug use. That's all about syringe exchange programs. It's a way of thinking about drug, I mean, it's drug users, it's drugs, it's the whole nine, right? What's different about that approach? Well, one is that it's entirely based on the public health system using public health metrics and a public health framework to think about the problem, evaluate the solutions, or, or the, you know, the, the proposals, to, and then to make adjustments based on what the data is that you're getting, all using the context of 
public health. Well, that's really interesting to us. And so we knew, we're friends with, we do a lot of work around those sorts of issues. We had reached out to the syringe exchange programs on the Rockefeller fight. They all said, oh yeah, no, we're totally with you on that. But they wouldn't really come to the meetings, mostly because they said, oh no, we got too much to do. Similarly, we had drug treatment providers and others who would, some of them would come, but... Well, so after that analysis, we said, you know what, we should, if we framed this as a health issue, what would that do? And there were two reasons that we, that we did that. One is the one I just mentioned, and the other is that when we thought about how we talked about things, because words have power, when we, talk about, when we talked about anything related to criminal justice, we immediately conceded the top authority to our opponents. In the criminal justice world, the district attorneys are at the head of the table as I am now. So if I'm the district attorney, I mean, this is only partly metaphorical because some of this is actually true. If we're having a discussion around criminal justice, reforms, a new law, or whatever else it is, and all of you are here in your capacities, you're a dean of a social work school, or the head of a, um, a, a professional association, or professionals in your own right across a broad range of fields, and you come in and you lay up on the table, you fill this table up with all the data that's out there that says that essentially what we're doing right now in terms of criminal justice doesn't really work all that well with respect to drugs. I mean, that's the kind of basic synopsis of it, but you bring me all the data, and we've got lawmakers in the room, and I'm the DA, and you lay a case as to why what we're not doing is what we're doing isn't working. I can just sit here and make stuff up. Because at the end of the day, the ultimate authority around those issues is the DA. Right? And I'm not being um, tongue in cheek here. If you do a media analysis, I don't want to get too far off of your question, David, but if you do a media analysis just in the last year, of all the articles that came out that referenced the Rockefeller drug laws and quoted a DA and then an, an advocate, nine, 99 times out of 100, what you will find is that what the DA's quote is, is just actually a lie. Like, it's not even just that it's wrong. It's just, it's a lie. And the reason I say lie, which is a, it's a pretty serious accusation to make, is because somebody knows better and they still say it anyways, that's lying, right? But yet that has driven the DA's and their um, language the, the construct within which they frame the debate and the discussion is the construct in which we talk about criminal justice issues. When we're in that, if we're, if this metaphorical room is the criminal justice room and we're all in here and talking about changing the Rockefeller drug laws, it's always a criminal justice response we're going to get if this is the criminal justice room, metaphorically, that we're in. When we change it to a health room or a health framework, all of a sudden, two things happen when we did this. So going back to your question, what were the things we did in the campaign? We did our assessment and we said, there's all these people that work in the health field over here that deal with drugs that have a much better impact. That their outcomes are remarkably better, demonstrably better. In health, they save money, they save lives. The outcomes for Rockefeller are actually terrible. So, so what if we just framed this thing as a health issue? And when we did that, all of a sudden, just by changing what we called the damn thing, syringe exchange providers, treatment providers, mental health professionals, all this whole other field that we thought should have been allies, but we hadn't figured out how to get them there yet, all of a sudden became stakeholders. That's the first thing we did was change the language. The second thing we did was go to the legislature and help them and the advocates they develop a better grasp of this language. So the legislature, the people that deal with criminal justice um, legislation, are the, you know, there are three committees, the codes committee, the judiciary committee, the corrections committee, right? All of those committees are organized around criminal justice language, metrics. They look at criminal justice examples. You follow what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. The committees that deal with the harm reduction programs, for instance, the syringe exchange, or dealt with like broader treatment issues, the health committee, the social services committee, the mental health committee, the addictions committee. You follow me? Mm -hmm. All their, like they're looking at policies and using health metrics to make decisions. So we got those committees together. We said, do you all ever get together to talk about drug policy in New York? Because we know you're for Rockefeller reform. And they're like, yeah, let's Rockefeller reform. We're for it. And we said, do you all ever get together to talk about drug policy issues? They said, no, we don't. So the second thing we did was to convene them um, for a discussion and hearings that were held. And then we created a conference to convene the advocates <coughs> so that, that we could in get better at using that language and thinking through some of that, because it's new territory. Um, and the third thing that happened that was a significant part of the campaign, David, after we did those two things, was the political dynamics undoubtedly were, were beneficial to us. 
because it, the, the um, Patterson was a strong uh, proponent of reform and the Senate Democrats took power. And so, but if, had we not done the two things prior to that, change the language and then bring in new stakeholders, it's my conviction that we would not have won Rockefeller reform this year in any way, shape, or form. And it what had, would have been passed, in my opinion, would have been <coughs> called something, the legislators would have called it Rockefeller reform, and us as advocates would have been saying, we're, we're coming back because it's not here yet. Thank you. Two questions, and you know, feel free to answer them or weave them in later on. One is, I assume you're talking about adult incarcerated populations and not, not the juvenile justice system. In which, in which, in terms well, of statistics? In, in any, yeah, statistically. I mean, if you take a global picture of who's incarcerated in New York, that does include the juvenile population. Okay. The Rockefeller drug law reforms don't address um, juveniles specifically. There's, there are some pieces in there within the statute that deal with juvenile age issues, but not in a significant way as juvenile justice. <laughs> because um, also you're talking essentially about a legislative strategy, which is, you know, makes a lot of sense and very important. Um, and and um, I was wondering about the fact we're talking almost essentially about re-enslaving a population, if in fact yeah. there is no reason, yeah. there's no justification, <laughs> it's a re-enslavement, a voluntary re-enslavement. So I was wondering about the court strategy uh -huh. in such a, you know, in such a situation and how that fits in. If you get to that. That's a really excellent question. Um, do other? I can actually maybe get a couple of questions and then I can try to answer them all if people have them. Yeah, I wanted to say that we may not be legislators, but we are um, legislators of policy within our own domains. So whether it's at a university or a professional association, or making policy about where you're going to make cuts or where you're going to transfer funds. And I'd like to have a conversation about how this process informs how we make rules and policies within our institutions. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your thinking about adding um, into the analysis uh, geography or neighborhood. Is it something I've thought about a neighborhood impact? And it, it, it really coincides and overlaps. And what has your organization on you? What are your thoughts about that? Where would it be helpful and where might it be a distraction? Yeah, no, that's a great question. There's another. Yeah, um, I'd be interested in thinking about, this is uh, piggybacking on, on uh, Sandy's comment, about how do you have this conversation with people who say, what does that have to do with me? I don't have anybody that's, but we don't have any incarcerated folks. Uh, you know, we care about everybody. Um, what, how does this translate if you're a mental health social service agency serving <coughs> children and adolescents? Yeah. <coughs> and I was going to tag on to that by just saying that the DA, using your metaphor, in relationship to the People's Institute, is white dominant culture that expresses Correct. itself organizationally. Correct. Thus, gets to make the decision as to whether racism is an issue right. and how much of it and to what degree. Yeah. yeah. That, no, that's absolutely right. And in fact, interestingly enough, just as a brief note on that, the only DA in the state of New York that has publicly <coughs> come out of uh, calling for reforms of the Rockefeller laws is David Soares in Albany County. He ran on a reform platform in 2004, he was re elected in 2008. He was 34 years old when he was elected. He was a young man. Mm -hmm. um, he's the only guy who came out saying we should do these reforms. And he's a powerful district attorney. He's, um, he has said publicly, I was just at a meeting with him uh, last week, and he said, we were talking to foundation representatives and trying to hopefully get the members from the big picture, <laughs> and said, uh, he said, I'm, I can only do so much on my own here to try to make changes systemically because I'm operating in a system that has me isolated. That he's, he, the political framework within which he operates is pretty isolating for, him, for them and to do anything differently in a dramatic way has been quite difficult. And he said, look, my office is locked up. It was about 11 o'clock at this, at this time um, when we were talking. He said, by noon my office will have locked up 50 people. Most of them will have been black men from the community that I live in. And he's like, and I have a hard time figuring out how to stop that without there being broader institutional transformations. And so it makes me think about the, it's, 
the, the DAs are the titular head of, those, of that system that is essentially and absolutely organized around institutional racism. And even when you get a very strong and powerful advocate within it, it in the absence of there being a movement around them, that they're, 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 it's difficult for them to act. Uh, one other thing, I wondered, uh, I've heard something about making decisions about how many prisons are needed in a community based on how many the elementary or, or kindergarten class of that community and how many kids of color there are. Yeah. So I'd like to be able to hear some of that so that when people are thinking about this doesn't have anything to do with me, it makes it easier to make a connection if you think of kindergarten and prison in some kind of connection. That's right. Let me I'll get two more, and then I want to come back to these to the other questions here. Yeah. When you started, you were saying that the framework could be used for understanding disproportionality in other areas. And when you look at what was happening with the rock, when you remove men from a community, you do something to seriously imperil families, and you could almost tie the rise in the foster care placement rates in communities with that with the drug epidemic and incarceration, et cetera. And also <clears throat> related to if you would do like a a overlay of targeted communities, you would find that these disproportionate numbers are cumulative. And then you have to consider what's the impact of the racial disparities and the cumulative effects of the racial disparities. And I, as you were talking, it just seemed to me that was, there were so many parallels between the drug placement race, child welfare, well-being, family disruption, et cetera, and it becomes like very circular and having a ripple effect. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and in fact, if you, the, the, um, the where is this, the letter here, um, uh, Stephen, that you that you that you sent around. If you look at the the disparities and the, the health disparities that have been coming out in this report, there were some people that uh, came in late. Uh, I passed out the the uh, the minority impact statement on the health care bill. If anybody would like it, it looks at Latino disproportionality, African American, like, and a website where you can comment on this disproportionality and the health care bill. If, if if with respect to geography. If you were to map out the communities that are having these health problems, that HIV and AIDS rates, cancer rates, uh, self-reporting of bad health, they're, pr they're going to pr be precisely the same communities in, in many urban areas, like in New York, that have the highest incarceration rates. So uh, there's, a, there's an immediate and direct correlation there. We actually, I don't have them with me today, but uh, my colleagues at the New York Academy of Medicine that we work with quite closely have put together this presentation with maps showing precisely that, like which zip codes in the city of New York um, have the highest incarceration rates and laying over asthma, cancer, HIV and AIDS, general health and well-being, and it's all the same communities. Um, did you, did you, yeah, you, you mentioned that the incarceration rates for black and Latinos uh, who go in for drug offenses are 90 95% of those that end up do, do we have data on the overall usage, the, the breakdown of race and ethnicity? We do. So yeah. how does that compare? How does the overall usage rate compare to who, who gets incarcerated? That's a great question as well. Generally, the usage rates are approximately equal by proportion. What that means is basically is white people and black folks and Latinos and Asians and folks are basically all using and selling at approximately equal rates. Um, we know that from government studies and from independent studies. Some find slight variations. Um, sometimes you'll see that um, white people, for instance, are higher rates of crack users in some studies and lower rates just under, um, well, they're actually mostly the crack users. Um, um, but a, there, there'll be a lower number in other rates. But the general thematic there amongst those things is that the usage rates are actually fairly equal, um, or roughly equal. Um, and so that's, it's one of the, the standout features as to what's taking place with incarceration rates because there's not, a there's not any bearing between who's being incarcerated and who's doing, who's doing whatever it was they got incarcerated for, right, so, allegedly. So I think that raises an issue in terms of doing these impact, these analysis, it's based, the issue isn't necessarily the legislation, it's how it's implemented. That's absolutely right. So that needs to be factored into it, so 
No, this is a good question. It actually brings me back to, to your thing about what's going on with the courts. And uh, so there's nowhere in the Rockefeller, the original Rockefeller legislation, if you read it, there's nothing in there that says that, that this legislation is targeted for on communities of color. And in fact, almost today, such legislation would be um, uh, even more probably difficult or impossible to introduce than it was back in 1973. Um, it is about implementation. And it is about, so this is where, in my opinion, the analysis that comes through right, with Undoing Racism Workshop and having that kind of global and historical framework, especially for people that work inside the institutions, is probably going to be one of the um, most important things that takes place with respect to Rockefeller implementation specifically and general implementation are on a range of issues. The, as you all know from being practitioners who are here on a discussion day to talk about anti-racism and, and figure out how to create your uh, more effective uh, institutions and programs and services and so forth, it's probably not a stretch for me to say or to guess that you're having a challenge sometimes to have your institutions reflect the historical perspectives that you're bringing to bear when you're talking about these issues. Institutions move slowly. Um, and sometimes people don't get it or whatever, so we get together to organize to figure out how we move this stuff forward. The legislation stuff implementation is the same thing. It's just happening in a different area over here. With respect to courts, and this will tie together, if you imagine, people ever been to the, um, well, we're going into the, we're talking to courts, the courts have done training, the judges are spout now supposed to have, you know, they're supposed to have discretion to make decisions now. Great. Have any of you ever been to the beach and made a sandcastle? People, right? You ever been to Sandcastle? You're at the beach, you got your bucket, you fill your bucket up with sand, you take the bucket, you turn it over, you set it on the ground, and, and you can pull the bucket up, and then you got that cool looking, like, chunk of sand that's just like that bucket shape, right? Everyone here know what I'm talking about? Yes. So, the shape has been formed by that shell, and until something comes along to bust it up, a foot dragged by some, you know, wayward dog, or some little kid with their spoon, or the waves itself, that thing will just stay there in exactly the same shape even though the shell isn't on there anymore. And what happened with Rockefeller is that Rockefeller is that bucket. And there's a lot of systems in that. Not the least of which are the courts, the prison system, the DAs, the mental health institutions that are, I mean, frankly speaking, mental health and drug treatment institutions, let alone a number of other social service institutions over the last 40 years, have married themselves to the criminal justice system because that's where the dollars are and that's where the people are. The number of drug treatment providers, um, I hope this isn't, I don't mean to be offensive, but if it is, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> the number of drug treatment providers that oppose reform of the Rockefeller drug laws, precisely because they're already getting what they wanted out of the status quo, is too many for me to name here. Right now, what we've got is that hardened piece of sand there, and we're trying to like kick it and, bu and bust it up. The biggest challenge we have is not actually changing statute at this point, it's changing culture. The culture of the institutions has been developed over the course of 40 years. And, and it goes back much farther. If you really tie in a race analysis to this, I mean, there's, it's, it's very, it goes right on back, you know, back into um, prior to the Civil War and slavery. It directly connects in with Jim Crow. The, I mean, in my opinion, the, the, the extension Anybody who's been through an Undoing Racism workshop understands that the, that the systems that made slavery possible existed afterwards, and that, and that was what we call now Jim Crow, and understands now that, the, that those systems still exist, and we're calling something else. In my view, the criminal justice system is, it was the next logical extension of that system that goes all the way back into slavery. Okay. Yeah, that and, is actually the basis, though, of my question, because this is culture and we know yep. that historically in civil rights it hasn't been the population yep. uh, who's taken the lead. The courts have gotten involved and the culture changed over time in response to in, in response yep. to uh, court activism, which is I suppose in some places a dirty word. You know, we're seeing this yep. now with uh, you know gay marriage. I mean, we're always saying this in terms of human rights. Yeah. So I guess that's. Well, let me be specific. I'll, I'll give you a specific serious. example. Then, okay, I got what you're saying, and I'll come back to um, your question about how do you talk to folks and um, and the and the geography stuff. I, I'll give you an example of this. We are doing court advocacy. Here's one. Here's one hard example that that is a 
it suggests how hard this thing is and why it's, it's going to take a while for us to make implementation work. Uh, and there's real broad term implica implications beyond just New York for making this work. And let me say this briefly. If because the drug war was institutionalized on a policy level first through the Rockefeller laws and so many other states referenced the Rockefeller laws when they passed their own versions. When Rockefeller reforms passed last year, it's really interesting to see who wrote about and talked about within the press and media what was going on in New York, all over the country. Within the corrections and sentencing and criminal justice fields themselves, New York is a potential harbinger of change, right? In Canada, I got a call two weeks after the reform, a week after the reform passed, they were debating last year and still are, implementing mandatory minimums in Canada. They're calling them Canada's version of the Rockefeller drug laws within the parliamentary debate. Now, that's not the name of the bill, right? But within the debate, that's what many lawmakers are saying. The guy from Canada called and said, did you really roll this thing back? And we said, yeah, we did. You know, he said, to us, he told me about what's going on. He's like, to us, who've been looking at the U.S. for so long, this is the criminal justice version of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now, this is a guy from the John Howard Society up in Canada, which is their... The equivalent here would, would probably be like the Vera Institute. So it's the most prestigious criminal justice you know, research institution there. Now that being said, the implications here, if, if reform implementation fails, could have reverberating effects. Because if we want Obama to end the war on drugs, as an example, they're going to need state-based examples that can illustrate what that actually looks like, an alternative approach. With that being said, when the reforms passed, um, we knew from the 2004 and 5 reforms that resentencing, right, there were small changes that were made in 2004 and 5, and about 1,000 people were eligible for resentencing as a result of those changes at that period. And we learned through the experience of people, they petitioned the court to be resentenced, and some of them were, and then they got out. We learned from that experience that if somebody had this, to go right into the courts, those that, that came in, you and I both go to court to be resentenced, and you, I walk in, and you walk in, or our petitions, and we're both eligible, and I just say, I want out, I'm eligible, I've been in prison a long time, it's time to go. And you walk in, and you say, here's my re-entry plan. And it says, I'm coming out, I'm going to get housing in the Bronx, this agency is providing mental health services, this agency is giving me counseling, that's my plan, there it is, you'll get out and I won't. That's what we learned from those resentencing. It's not hard to, to imagine that, right? So when the reforms passed in 2009, Last year we said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna wait and see what happens here with reentry, like, because surely people will come together and figure out. Well, by June, nobody had gotten together to plan for the fact that on October seventh, twelve to fifteen hundred people were gonna be eligible for release. So we convened defense attorneys across the state who were gonna be providing reentry, I mean, uh, resentencing legal support, and then we convened reentry groups and then a range of service providers, many of whom. Some of you might be part of the organizations that were in the room, but we worked with HSC um, and NIAM and many others to get mental health providers, housing providers, drug treatment counselors, the human and social service field. I, mean, I, had, I don't know where Sandy went, but she was sending stuff out too. We said, hey, we need people to come to these meetings, and people came. And we created a list um, uh, as we did that, and we asked the lawyers, we said, what do you need to get people out of prison right now? Those, and they said, I, I don't have any other time. I need. I know my client needs mental health services. I know they're going back to the Bronx. I need to just call up a group in the Bronx that provides the services. I can't chase anybody down, and t they need to tell me that they can provide them, and I can write it into the resentencing petition. We created that list. We provide folks. We send it out. It's all wrapped up. All great and good. Hopefully, it's useful. By the time October seventh rolled around, we've got a list of a hundred service providers in the city of New York who are ready and willing to go knowing that there's no extra funding associated with this practice, mind you, and a bunch of legal agencies that are talking to each other. That's all well and good, except for two things. One, we, the fact that we convened those groups is an expression of a, of, a, of a deep institutional problem. We don't provide services. We don't work in reentry. We don't do legal defense. We do advocacy, and I'm more than happy to organize folks for something. None of the institutional capital, however, that could have been really useful in pulling that project together are, is stuff that we really had in those fields and none of the benefit that accrued out of the process was able to be really effectively transferred back over into those fields. So when I end up in the course of that process sitting with the governor's staff people to talk about resensing and talk about like, here's what's happening and what we got to do with the courts because the judges have to understand what's going on here. They just spent 40 years 
not having discretion, and now they're making decisions. Let's look at some training in here. I bring in people that are from the defense field and the reentry fields and other fields. You know, we try to organize a group to go do it. The fact that I'm in there is a problem, though, because the fields themselves are not prepared for something that is um, for the scope of the change that we that is now facing us. Not simply not prepared. Not prepared to take well, advantage of the reform. Well, what should have happened is that as people were moving out of criminal justice and into service and health, the funds followed. Right? I mean, you know, One this is hope. like an unfunded mandate. You know, people suddenly are there at the doorstep, which is great that you've gotten them out of prison into the, the service, but there's no funding. Yeah, well, the, but this wasn't even... So this is a great point and not the point. Mm. Because what we're talking about is not... I mean, we are talking about it with respect to organizational health. You have to account for what your, what your, your organization can do. Get it. I'm, I'm with you. We have the same concerns. With, what's, with respect to what's happening here historically and politically, I mean, look, at the end of the day, if we're only going to do the stuff that we're getting paid to do, we may as well not be a part of a movement in the first place. And that's just speaking very frankly. That's not movement building. It's just not. Because the moment is, and we got, we, I mean, mind you, we got a hundred agencies on this thing agreeing to take clients without getting any more funding. So they did that part, which was fantastic. The part that I'm thinking about, however, is the organizing challenge that various institutions and sectors have now facing us. Because here's what's going on within the courts. We've worked on trying, we're working now to try to set up continuing judicial education. Because OCA did it and we tried to get in there and they wouldn't let us and all this sort of stuff. Well, here's what's going on with implementation in the courts. OCA has made it, in, this is probably more down the, in the weeds than many of you want to be, but OCA, Office of Court Administration, made an administrative decision that only, even though statute says all judges have discretion, they said, we're going to create these things called diversion judges and let the administrative judge in every district determine who those judges are going to be. So what does that look like? Well, in the Bronx, it means that the drug court judge, who's actually been quite good, and has a whole court that's related to probably many of your institutions here. They know immigration, you know, uh, defense folks, and language providers, and mental health folks. You know, they, they, they got folks as part of that court. She's been told she's not going to receive any new clients as a result of Rockefeller Philadelphia, or any new defendants in her court. Instead, there's two drug court judges, I mean, uh, diversion judges that have been appointed. And the administrative law judge and the two drug ju judges that were appointed as drug courts, I mean, diversion judges, mind you, all judges are supposed to have discretion. But the way they're doing it in the Bronx is that all those judges, here's the two judges that are going to do it, and they happen to be former narcotics prosecutors and officers. And there's a tacit agreement that the people that go into that court are going to be approved by the Bronx County DA. So you have a 40-year history where DAs make the decision. We change statute to say, that's done. But the culture has maintained it. And so we have a long challenge ahead of us. But it's not just in the courts. Even going back to Mary, your question, what do you, how do you talk to people about what's going on? It's my guess that whether you're providing mental health services, social service, like whatever social service it is that people in this room are providing, or your institutions, I, I, I would, I'm not a betting person, but I'll bet actually a significant amount of money that there's a, there's a portion, if not a size of one of your populations that you see as clients whose families or themselves have had run-ins or contact with the criminal justice system. There's no one singular mechanism through which people have been funneled into that's bigger than the Rockefeller drug laws. The drug laws in this city and state are the single biggest avenue through which people come into contact with the criminal justice system. It's not the only one. What, what is the, but it's the single largest one. What is, and, and this is, you know, because I think you're talking about a multi-pronged approach, which yeah. I think is very important, and this is, my thinking is not either or in this. Yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking about uh, what are the possibilities at some point down the road of getting some lawyer who wants to make a name for himself to do a class action suit based on the data about just plain and simple, uh, obviously problems with the Constitution here. And I, I don't know. Maybe you mean with respect to the racial with, disparities? With respect to racial disparities, because you know we, we know that culture changes also because of court activism and it takes a long time for you to get a decision and then you know you, you, you kind of 
drag people along and some people never get, but you know, people die and people come because yeah. of fact on the ground. And um, we, the whole history of civil rights in this country the is equivalent, what happened because of that. The equivalent game that I'd like to speak to <laughs> of the prisons themselves and their tie to employment, as false as it is, is a similar one in the social service system. Yep. And we have all the data in the world and the, uh, that about the outcomes. The resistance in terms of culture, white cultural organization to that is very similar. We don't want to change because we don't get funded to do anti-racism and if we did get funded we don't know how to right. count. Um, and, and so the tie-in to the resistance that we find, one is that everybody knows everything, and particularly in New York. Everybody knows everything, but no one is organized. So we have yep. these huge fragmented uh, pieces of information, we think. But organizing is the key. The mandate that might come from uh, a, a, you know, a, a, an entity, whatever that entity, is largely, um, that's the equivalent of the judicial process, takes a long time and this sort of thing. But the organizing, you know, we, we maintain at the Institute, you can't legislate and undoing racism. You can't, legislation's an important thing. You can only organize as you did and, or you've done and this sort of thing. At the same time, no one, uh, because we all have a vested interest in this status quo, and I'll start because I don't want to preach, but the, uh, you know, for example, people of color, as in the prison system, will look organizationally in our systems, are usually at best middle management, uh, most traditionally entry-level employees. Those of us who license, uh, decide the criteria of who's a professional and not, um, we legislate out of the discussion a lot of black and brown people. There might be good reasons that I'm not aware of, but, but this is problematic. So what you have in the human services field is a, a lot of us who are sitting at judge and jury around issues that we know very little about beyond the intellectual. Yeah. That, but we are empowered to carry out policy and to mandate uh, funded requirements.